Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Caslin and Always Acting Up. This is a podcast where I share all of my personal journeys and stories as an actress in LA. You'll learn a couple tips and tricks along the way. This episode, um, I have a special guest. I am super excited to be joined by the executive producer of the feature film Pink Opaque. I have Dave Ragsdale with me here today. But before we get into these conversations about creating a feature film, I want to give a shout out to You guys who have been supporting me, um, I now officially have an Instagram page uh, that is always acting up podcast. So thank you guys who are joining me there. Um, And of course, I can't do this without my producer, Hisani Johnson. Okay. And now I would like to officially, officially welcome my guest, Dave Ragsdale. Hi, Dave. Hey, how you doing? It's wonderful to be here. Thanks for thanks for showing us some love. Yeah, I'm excited. And And normally, most of my guests I've like kind of met before or I have like a general idea. This is our first time having a conversation. So this will be a first fun chit chat for both of us, I think. Yeah, it's yeah, it's wonderful to meet you. Um, And uh, it's wonderful to be here. This is such a I think you're doing a great podcast. And I I love I love the positivity Mm -hmm. and the energy and 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 you do have one one hell of a great producer, uh, I have to admit. Um, But uh, and it and and I appreciate you lent, you know lending a voice to independent films and whatnot. We're you know we're we're the little films that can yeah. I guess you know and we need every little bit of love and help we can along because the way. Because this journey so, is hard. You. I say that all the time. I'm like this journey is so hard. We need as much help and promotion as we can. And so you were saying you happen to know my producer Hassani Johnson. How are we connected? How did this all come about? Our lovely films have been playing uh, with each other at many, many of the the film festivals virtually in 2020. We've been, I, I don't even know how many film festivals we've, uh, we've, you know, played together, but it's been wonderful. We started at American Black Film Festival together. Mm-hmm. I think that was the first and, and there's been a, a good handful uh, since then. Um, We've lost quite a few times to Hassani's <laughs> wonderful picture, um, uh, which has been great because um, one of the first things that I think he and I both kind of really tuned in on was we kind of say our films have mm. similar DNAs. You know, there's a lot of family story within both of our films. You know, there's a brother sister dynamic. There's family history dynamics. There's um, obviously a very diverse and very talented mm-hmm. cast involved and also a pretty diverse and talented group behind the scenes making things happen, you know? So um, although our films are very different, we've been very, very fortunate to kind of had this programming run with with Takeout Girl where I think people are able to see two very different stories and but yet with still very similar and really wonderful uh, complementary Mm -hmm. aspects, you know, between the two films, so. It's been fun. It's been really fun. And like, oh, congratulations to Takeout Girl winning Las yeah. Vegas Black Film Festival. I happen to, I'm happy to say we won Yay. 2020. So uh, we, yeah, so we were the That's winners fantastic. in 2020. Uh, so I have that, I have the the trophy in my office and they're wonderful people. And, but it was all virtual for us. We couldn't be That's there. That's what I was going to ask. Whatnot, but um, yeah, it's, it's nice to share a win with Takeout Girl, you know, because usually mm-hmm. we're, together in a festival so you know there's only one winner for certain categories of course for everything and happy to lose to such a great title like and and happy to be going out mm-hmm. you know not jumping ahead too far but happy to go out on distribution with with uh Hassani and team yeah, Takeout girl as well because i think our films going out mm-hmm. into the world together um will be will be good for the i don't know it would be good for Pink, at least. I know that. I yeah, know and, and I know it's been Pink, a really so. interesting experience for a lot of the filmmakers. I know we'll get into festivals a little bit later. Um, everything being virtual, it's like you worked so hard for the past, I don't know how long it took for this film, and you're like, yes, now we get to go to festivals and meet people and have fun, and then you're like, uh, it's all virtual, great. Yeah, that's been, you know, I'm sure Hassani and Team Takeout Girl have the same mm-hmm. problems, right? Like, you don't really get to meet anybody. You don't really get yeah. to connect you know any of that kind of hey let's toss back a cocktail or a beer and just say who are you as a human being and what are the stories you want to tell you know you know you know know, what i was noticing though and i was kind of wondering if maybe you felt this way as well i was noticing at some of the virtual festivals they're doing like breakout rooms where it's like you know people 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 and i'm almost thinking like 
are you almost meeting more people than if you were at a live event and people were in their little groups and having drinks and you don't really get to go up and talk to them now you're sort of like forced into these breakout rooms i think i think it's more like like you said forced into breakout rooms and then all of a sudden you're just sitting there with people that there's no Mm. natural organic Mm -hmm. connection you know i mean i was lucky hasani and i were able to kind of like connect you know what i mean and then we started talking to each other and then whatever you know what i mean and we've been able to, you know, spark some sort of, you know, minimal, like relationship, minimal relationship out of this, like mm-hmm. wanting to keep in touch and all that kind of stuff. But it's very often you're in a room full of people very that shy. Um, maybe aren't real. Yeah. Well, you're sh- either you're shy, they're shy, but also it's a lot of like, put all the directors in a room, put all mm-hmm. the writers in a room, put all the producers in a room where, you know, I produce, I direct, I write, blah, blah, blah. But I need to meet like, who are the suits showing up at the festivals? You know, who are the business people? Who are the, you know, who are the lawyers? Who are the agents? Who are the, you know what I mean? That's, those are the people I need to meet. You know, it's nice to meet yeah. your fellow filmmakers, but the the kind of like connection, the dot connection that I think mm, a lot yeah. of, uh, at least you think you would re- like have or receive as you are going to festivals where you're meeting people in the industry and you're meeting different people that do different things than you, right. I guess is basically what I'm saying. Totally that's sense. been that's been my biggest challenge met a lot of wonderful people yeah. a lot of great directors a lot of great writers a lot of great producers but it's like it's hard to get that kind of um what you would seek if you just saw a, a whole pool, pool of fish you yeah know? <laughs> you can go ahead and like pick uh oh, pick anyway. who you want and so getting back into pick opaque um first of all before we get into like all the good details and stuff can you give us a brief synopsis of what the story, what the film is about. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm always terrible at this kind of the the log line, but you know, it it's a it's a real human story mm-hmm. about life in Los Angeles, about struggling and trying to figure out your way in the world and your path forward. And we really stru- tried to strive for authenticity and and solid characters, but it's a film about a you know L.A. film student who's struggling to finish his thesis film. He has one week to finish or else he doesn't graduate. And he's got to, you know, navigate kind of this romance that's kind of going a little further than he ever thought it would be. And it's something that's really important to him as well as, you know, meeting this uncle that he's kind of been estranged from not understanding why or the reasons. And, uh, and the, you know, it's kind of the story unfolds of, his past, his future, his present, all kind of mashing together to see if he can figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know? um, again, I'm not the best of that. I'm sure I have a log line if you want me to read one or whatever. You know, but, I'm going to... Uh, that's I, basically I, it, you know? I, I, I watched the whole film and I know you guys have a trailer, so I'm going to attach the link to the trailer in the comment section below. When I was watching it, um, the first thing that popped into my mind, I was like, oh, yeah, I know this story. Somebody, I don't know if it was you somebody lived this story so how did you guys come up with this idea is this your story because it's so relatable especially in LA like gosh we're all just struggling and trying to have a career whose story is this all right so it originated um it's not really any one of our stories it's a it's Mm. a kind of a collective mashup of several different stories and different kind of point of views on the same kind of struggle, right? We've all gone through this struggle to find a pathway towards being creative professionals, right? Where we are being able to do the work that we love and make a living doing it and try to tell great stories and do good work, right? Um, And actually be legitimate people within the industry and all that kind of good stuff. So the, the real, real origin of everything is that Derek Perry, our writer director, um, he and I have been professional colleagues for years. He, he had edited a lot of the things I was directing and producing. And then he became a really, really talented director on his own, like doing his, doing whatever he, you know, pro- progressing along in his career. And so for a few years, we were talking about trying to find a way to do a demo reel as a narrative feature. You know, I, I as a hmm. producer, I saw in this script here, you said list some of your career highlights, but Like as a producer and as a director, I had done everything except episodic narrative television and a narrative feature. I had done, Mm. you know, feature documentaries. I had done 
all kinds of specialty television stuff. I had done promos in, you know, tons and tons of like live entertainment, live multicam, live this, live that. And so the only reason I was kind of in this business to begin with was I want to do narrative features. That's okay. But I got sucked into this world of doing work for studios and labels and whatever. And that sounds, oh, poor Dave. No, that's not. It's been a wonderful experience, a wonderful career. I totally get it. Amazing things and, and with some wonderful people, but I've always dreamt of telling my own stories. Mm -hmm. So Derek wrote the original draft of, of pink. And then I kind of bounced back like a, a red lined version. And Mm -hmm. he said, yeah, yeah, that that's good stuff. And I was like, all right, should we try to do this? So at that point, he and I worked together to kind of mature the story into something that was filmable in a very short amount of time and on a budget Mm. in order to that we, but yet still hanging on to that authenticity of the characters and the place and the time and the struggle and all of that stuff. So draft, a few drafts later, he and I kind of had settled on what we thought was a shooting script. And then we started going out to kind of key crew first and then started looking at casting. Mm -hmm. But overall, the story kind of maturated from Derek and I um, just basically kicking the tires on every choice, every choice the characters made, every choice that, you know, every, every situation, every scenario, every decision that they made, they'd always, we'd always say, would come back to data. Okay. What, what did you think they would want to do? What would the character, what would you think it would be good? What would be best, blah, blah, blah. And we would leave it down to away from opinion and feeling. And mm-hmm. like, what would the person really do? Like what, what would happen? Like, okay, the, whatever it is in the story, I don't want to give too much away, but whatever happened at that moment, what is the most authentic choice that that character would make along this journey? And, and, that, and that's what we really just nailed hard for about three, four months on that. Yeah, that's what I, I was curious. How many drafts do you think you wrote? Like, when is it finally at the point where like, yeah, I have the story right, but like how many drafts did you guys do until you're finally like, ah, shooting script? And did it, you have other I'm people sure. besides besides you and your writer? Did you have other people read it to give you an outside opinion? All right, so first question, I forget exactly how many drafts, but I think it was six or eight drafts. Wow. But it wasn't that everything changed, mm-hmm. right? There's certain there's certain pivots within your story that you know, you know, it's cornerstone stuff. You know, you know you have certain things that are going to going to that you want to you want to play, right? But basically, we rewrote the ending many, many times. Um, it's the same ending, but we would alter the audience's perception of it as we were writing it, changing different destinies for characters and things like that. And so that's what really where the drafts came from. Then it was very limited in regards to um, who read it. It mm. was very tight chested. Um, one of the first reads was uh, one of our key creative producers, Mario Becerra. And um, as soon as he read it, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah let's do this. Cause mm. he's a born and bred LA boy. Um, one hell of a guy, uh, one like, of my best buds. This sounds um, familiar. This feels familiar. Yeah, he's just, he's a great, great guy. And, and he grew up here. He knows the city. He was able to do all kinds of, well, we'll talk production, but all mm. kinds of things during production. But after he read it, he was like, yeah, let's do this. And so it added a little bit of uh, weight to, to, to Derek and my decision to kind of try to make this, to roll it forward. Mm-hmm. All right. And then the second part of your question was, my apologies. The second part of my question was, oh, I was I was asking if you had like sort of outsourced readers, somebody who wasn't related yeah, to the no, project. Yeah, no, yeah, right. So I answered that. Yeah, no, we didn't really. It was very tight just with Mario. And then, um, yeah, that's about it. And mm-hmm. until we started getting into, okay, this is real and we're going to we're going to do this. Got it. You know, and then once that happened, there was a very small group of people um, that we had read because we didn't want it to get too muddied Mm -hmm. yeah too many opinions sometimes i think everybody's got an opinion you're like okay that's great but no yeah and when you're striving for authenticity Mm -hmm. too many opinions sometimes can bog down what that character really would do totally what that choice really would be Mm -hmm. and so how do you go about and 
you can limit this question, limit this answer as much as you want. I know everyone's burning question because everyone, not everyone, but you know, so many people have the idea of I want to make a feature, I have a script. How do you go about getting the budget, getting the the crew and the equipment? How do you piece all that together? Because I feel like that's like the burning question everybody has. Well, how do you get the money? How do you, what do you do next? How do you do this? Yeah, um, obviously that's a huge huge question but yeah. not nutshell for this for funding because it was a demo reel ultimately mm-hmm. pink opaque is a demo reel for me i just wrote it i just wrote a check um mm-hmm. you know me and a few close people as well as you know Der- derek participated he put in put in some cash too but it was basically our demo reel it's so, an investment in yourself yeah it, it you know i i know people who have spent more on spec commercials Totally. You know, for, a, you know, maybe a series, you know, two spec 30 second commercials. That was, that was the way we funded the movie. It's, mm-hmm. there's no like special story of a wonderful, a, you know, angel falling from the sky that oh, you, know, you no. meet at a, you know, bedside at the hospital or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, there's none of, there's none of that good stuff. I'd like to write a story like that maybe someday, but um, it, it just basically came down to brass tacks. I want to make a movie. I sat my wife down and said, can I please do this? <laughs> and she she said, okay, you can basically stop working for two years, mm-hmm. take money out of our savings account that mm-hmm. we didn't really have to take out to begin with and go do what you've wanted to do for your, your entire career. I got to you know, give it's not, I haven't for your wife here. I mean, big shout. For the support. Big shout. Because that's hard. I, I'm living it myself and I'm like, oh God. Like, is it yeah. almost done? But at the same time, you're like, okay, well, this could be good for all of us. It's And it's challenging because your time, your time is being consumed. Any funds yep. goes to other yep. things. Yeah, I, yep. I get it's, it. It's, I know. People that haven't, like, you do get it. Like, you have you live it, right? Mm-hmm. And people that haven't, you know, for your audience out there, for anybody that, you know, is thinking about, you know, I, I really, really, really want to tell stories. I really want to make a feature film. Mm-hmm. I say to them absolutely 100 percent. live your dream go for it do it absolutely do it but realize that it will be more work more time more care more concern Mm -hmm. more stress more anything you want to add you know just underline it right there whatever word you want to throw in there it's going to be more of that than you expect yeah but hope you love your story you know i've heard some good things here and there from people, you know, success, successful filmmakers, you know, it's like, make sure you really love your story, mm-hmm. which, you know, either you do or you don't and go for it. But the second part is about getting crew together yeah. and all of those kinds of things. So the way we approached this was we went into industry contacts that we had other people that were working in a, in a commercial or branded or entertainment world Mm -hmm. that we've, you know, that we, that, you know, our core business and just reached out and asked people who wanted to get involved. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I I think one of the best overall theories we had or approaches we had was we can't afford you. Right. So what would you like to do for as close to free as you can be? Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then, and then just take as many small contributions as you can that end up adding to much larger uh, capability and much much larger um, results. So that's basically how we built the crew. Mm-hmm. Thank God Mario came on as a producer for free. Ryan Van Ert came on as a DP for free. That's amazing. Um, and then obviously I was working for free Right. Derek was working for free. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a handful of people I'm forgetting right now that were just straight working for free. Yeah. And then everyone else was working on basically stipends. I don't know. Did that answer the question? Yeah. I, th- I think so. It, it, it did. You know, his, what his, one of the things Hassani always says, he's like, you know what? If you can't pay people, allow them to use their creativity to get the things that they need. Like if they needed to maybe put in a little bit extra with their creativity with the camera or their lighting like allow them to do so otherwise they're just they're just working and i think that's what you're doing and what you were saying earlier is 
I, I feel like we hear about these stories and these are the, probably the ones that get the press. Like I'm always hearing about actors who just get discovered in a parking lot or they're at the bank and so-and-so saw them or this filmmaker was just granted $50,000. I'm like, who are these people? Because I don't know any of them. Every single filmmaker I meet uh, on the indie level and actor, we're all working our asses off and we're doing it for free and we're doing it all day long. I'm not talking like an eight to five. I'm talking like sometimes... We'll have a phone call at like 10.30 at night or a, a meeting at 7 a.m. Or I'll have like five auditions in a day and I'm pulling my hair out and I'm putting all this work into it and I may not even get a call back. I may not even get a job. So you have to really truly love and commit to what you're doing. And great job to your to your crew who jumped on board with that. It's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was all about, you know, um, leading with love and leading with honey. You know what I mean? There was, mm -hmm. it, like you said, it's... It, and going back to yeah, what you just said, it's like th this is more of a lifestyle than a oh, uh, career yeah. choice. You know, it is a in, lifestyle in many ways, um, and and that's cool. I've always been that way. I'm, I mm -hmm. mean, I, since a little kid, I you know fell in love with you know film and theater and everything. And I you know since a little kid, I've been doing whatever it took to try to do something creative and have fun with it. You know, there's two people, if I could shout out real quick Absolutely. that I still don't know that get enough credit for this, the success of this, like pick, like for it to get to where it is today. Mm -hmm. And the first going back towards amazing women involved in this and hey. women involved. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> is my co-producer Courtney Poey. Hi Courtney. Who is, yeah, Courtney, big shout out to Courtney. Yes. She is the reason that we didn't ultimately just crash into a mountain or something. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like it, it was, it, she, every, every invoice, every schedule, every meal, every location, every rental, every crew person, everything went across her desk. Wow. She lifted so much weight for me that I was able to focus more in on the creative and the nuts and bolts of really producing the movie as well as helping direct the movie mm -hmm. and helping deal with drones and all the other things. And she carried so much weight and so much water. Huge applause to Courtney Poe. Hang on, hang on. We'll, do, now... we'll just do another one. Courtney. <laughs> yeah, Courtney. She's awesome. And then, and then the, going back to just Ryan Van Ert, our DP. Straight up, mm -hmm. showed up for free, worked his his behind off. So we'll yeah. keep it PG. Yeah. So hard, such a hard worker, such an incredible vision, like for the littlest detail in our frame. Yeah. And he never ever, you know, sometimes like it just becomes a long day and mm. you just want to say to yourself, you know what? Mm. That looks good enough. Mm. We got to move on, mm -hmm. right? Ryan never had that. He always had that like, hey, two seconds and boom, now it's perfect and roll. Yeah. And it was always with a smile and it was always on time and it always made the picture better, but he was a dream to work with. This, this wouldn't be here without those two people. I mean, millions, like yeah, lots everybody. of other people, but those two particular people are almost more important than Derek and almost more important than myself in the contributions that they, that they, that they brought. Well, so. It, it paid off because everything looks really great and you guys have distribution. So I think it's a win for for everybody overall. And yeah, yeah. and so what, now that you have your your crew and you used a lot of you worked with a lot of people that you knew and have worked with before. Was it similar with casting? Were these actors that you have worked with before or did you guys go out and call casting sessions? How did that come about? Yeah, casting was a lot of fun. So luckily, I grew up acting, you know, I mm. was fortunate to, you know, do things like uh, work with the Royal Shakespeare Company in high school. And That's awesome. so like I, and I was an acting major in college. And so okay. I know actors, I know, I really know performance. And I understand the difference between what an audition is and versus what you might be able to do once they're on their feet and really working on, on a character. Um, so we, this is also a non-union film. So mm. we went, wide straight up open call kind of to the internet receiving hundreds and hundreds of submissions like um, across the country no basically la la some new york mm -hmm. some atlanta but predominantly just la 
Um, and, you know, obviously this was pre COVID. So people could just, you know, submit and show up, you know? Mm. So, you know, this is late 2018 when we started okay. like real late 2018. And so, yeah, we saw a few hundred people for sure um, wow. between all the different, different roles. So we were very lucky to one of the first cast members that we uh, locked in was uh, Kyan Dunbar, mm -hmm. who plays uncle, the, you know, the uncle in the, in the film, um, uncle Robin. And there was something about his audition that really just kind of made me say, all right, this is the guy. And it, it really came, I don't know if actors are using this language or anything anymore, but it came down to what I learned when I was younger, learning as actor is like the, the different gears, the different levels, mm -hmm. like what he could do at a very low pace, mm -hmm. very low emotional rank tempo versus what, when they're, you know, in the high, like I'm screaming and yelling and whatever. Right. He had those ranges where he could just be very subtle and yet, yet he could also go over the top and mm -hmm. he had a great range, which was wonderful. And then the second actor that we signed up, um, who ended up being actually the third person I should say this film wouldn't be here without, um, is Daniel C. Dan mm -hmm. So Daniel C who plays Bobby, the brother, okay. um, he was also one of the first actors that we we said all right he can he can do this he can do this very well and then he jumped on and he was so helpful with things we ended up bringing him on as an associate producer oh that's fantastic and he just yeah he just and he just helped us so with so many things he mm -hmm. he helped us find the incredibly talented aaron dominguez who plays aj who's mm -hmm. now um taken off himself on, on his own career. I think he's got a Amazon series coming up and um, he was doing some Snapchat awesome. series and you know, Aaron's a fantastic actor. We, mm -hmm. we found Aaron. Aaron was actually one of the last actors uh, to join uh, the primary crew, mm -hmm. primary cast. And he came directly through Daniel. He did a, he did a phone. Um, he did a like a just a like a little uh, whatever it is on your phone, like a record on his phone. Mm -hmm. Text okay. me the scene, and 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 the next day he was on a plane to come to set. It was like, wow. let's do this, you know. And he showed up and he crushed. He did a great job. But so the cast came from different, you know. It was a lot of auditions, and then it was some just like luck, and then even for here's one crazy small example. I know we can edit. You can cut whatever you want in and out of this, but. <laughs> um, literally the last cast member that we, you know, somebody that with dialogue, you know, mm -hmm. that had scenes was, um, Bill who played the character of Wallace. I don't know if you remember, but the uncle has a friend who's also his financial advisor mm -hmm. and there's some, there's some trouble in the homeland and, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the golden goose isn't as goosey anymore. So, yes. um, Wallace ended up being cast on set as an extra. So he was supposed to just be someone at a cocktail party mm -hmm. and his improv on set was just so incredible that, you know, Derek was at one side of the set at a video village we had, and I was at another side of the set at a different video village that we had. And we both ran to each other and was like, that's Wallace. And wow. we're like, yeah. So we cut the take of the party scene. Mm -hmm. So you'll remember there's a cocktail party scene and, and we're in the backyard of Robin's house. And there's a guy kind of teasing Robin and that, that was all improvised. And so, Bill, who played Wallace, was cast in that scene during that scene. And uh, we just ran up to him and just kind of said, hey, Bill, um, would you like to play the character of Wallace? It was yes. the accountant. Uh, and he was just like, yes. he goes, hell yeah. Uh -huh. I love that. Uh -huh. We're like, all right, just keep doing what you're doing. And we'll give you your s s sides for tomorrow when you're done with this scene. And we'll talk about what we're going to do. Those are the and stories so, I think we all dream of as actors, just being on set. And they, just being well, like, there you go. <sighs> Yes. That's one of those. So what it was is, you know, as an actor, it was being nice. Mm -hmm. It was being respectful to the process. It was being um, present. It was listening to the other actors around you. It was it being in the moment with them and being authentic and real. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't show how great I am. It was show how much I can support the other people around me and raise their performances around me. Right. It was all of those things. And we just like, and then, so 
after we wrap that scene, we we're discussing, all right, so we're still trying to find a cover set. I think his scene was coming up in two days or whatever his next scene. Mm-hmm. And he's like, why don't you shoot it at my house? I'm what? Like, this guy is an angel. Like, what a dream. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Dream. dream. And so he came through my production designer, Kevin Young, who's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my childhood friends. He actually went to my mom's art school when oh. we were little, little kids. Um, and he's a tremendous designer. And this Bill was just one of his friends. I said, I just need you to come with like five of your friends because there's no way you can cast chemistry like that. Mm-hmm. Here's a note to anybody trying to direct or, or produce a party scene. Get people that know each other. <laughs> They'll Don't have a try real to good cast time. chemistry <laughs> of a party without people knowing each other. Because if you could just invite 20 people that know each other, bam, there's yeah, your background. Yeah, you're right. They're going to be having fun and chit-chatting anyways. Maybe yeah, a little too much fun. To worry but... about them. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's stories like that. It's like it, 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 it was always a progress thing. Like we tried to progress as we went, mm-hmm. make it as great as we can as we went, discover new things whenever we're possible as we went. And, you know, there's a lot of little gems like that along the way. Yeah. And I noticed you have a ton of diversity in the film. Was that something you guys went specifically for? Or once you got the brother character, it sort of fell into place the rest of the way? No, it was always a a diverse story. That was that was the, the, the number one thing was that we wanted to do something that highlighted Los Angeles. And Los Angeles is clearly a very, very diverse city. Yeah, it you is. Know, uh, Derek, Derek and I, you know, I moved out here uh, first and then he kind of moved out here a couple of years later and we both ind- independent of each other just really fell in love with LA. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the life here, the people here, working here, um, the, vibes. the culture here, the restaurants, the vibes, the whole, all of it. You know, there's, there's, it's, it's really, especially coming from Brooklyn, which was already oh. incredibly, incredibly diverse, you know? It's not called the planet for, for, you know, for no reason, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so that was it. It was about trying to tell a very LA specific story and you can't do that without great diversity. And yeah. And it's also came down to trying to place characters that are in authentic positions in non-traditional roles, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Travis is a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. He's not a rapper or a basketball player. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. You know, Kristen is a fashion designer. You know, she's not like a K-pop star or a whatever, you know, whatever's, pro- you know. Stereotype. You know, stereotypes. Yeah. Tropes. You know, yeah. we try to avoid all the tropes. And it really wasn't until we got into festivals that that I was like, oh, I guess a <laughs> black director and a black lead says that this is a black movie okay cool that's great all right great but to us it's always been an la movie it's a la story like that's how i see it i don't see it as i don't even know if this is a correct term as a black movie or an asian movie i feel like it's a universal movie i i see it as an la movie too because that was the first thing i was like oh this is an la movie this is something i I feel like so many people can relate to this type of story i I was curious um uh travis uh played by elijah booth He's a filmmaker in the story, and he's editing on a project. Do you guys actually have that film, that project that he was editing? Like, is there that story that he was working on? Is that anywhere? Is that was that even like an actual thing? Well, everything, everything. Yeah. Well, there they are actual things. Yeah, we went out and filmed everything um, Mm -hmm. for the documentary and whatnot. Um, Ryan got to play with like old VHS cameras, and then recording 4k off the little monitor on the camera and all kinds of just weird techniques to try to create the look and the feel of that documentary Mm -hmm. um but no unfortunately it doesn't it doesn't live as its own that might be a nice little side thing for you know yeah yeah but um but yeah we shot all the all the plates and and you know trying to be as respectful as we can to um, the community that we were trying to raise, you know, raise some awareness for. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the homeless problem here in Los Angeles is Rough. is incredible, and it's just it's getting worse and worse um, mm. by the day. Hopefully, you know, hopefully there's some sort of solutions. But you know, we wanted we wanted it to pay respect and be enlightening, but yet show kind of the look and feel of what what people are going through. I, and, I think you guys. Play. 
I think you guys did. That was one thing I noticed. I was like, oh, the scenery here, like this is it. And I think people a lot of times, you know, whatever we see on TV, Beverly Hills, Venice Beach, all glitz, glam, whatever. And you're like, actually, it's it's really not like that, like hardly at all. And so when you guys were out doing a lot of those shots, I know you had a lot of drone shots. Did you guys, um, was it sort of guerrilla style or did you have to go up and get permits? Like, how did you guys do that? Because I know it's so hard. So to get that kind of yeah, footage. I was just saying it's really hard to get that kind of footage without a permit and massive budgets. Yeah, well, obviously we were very budgetarily challenged as I like to say. Mm -hmm. um, and it, again, with everything else, it, it was very much a mixed approach. So for certain things like for say, uh, for example, the drone photography, that was very, you know, very legit. So I worked with a pilot who, you know, licensed pilot, both for aircraft as well as drone. Um, and again, Daniel C showing up with connections or maybe it was Courtney, I forget. Somebody who was friends. awesome. But somebody who was awesome on the team brought KW to the, to the, to the plate. And mm -hmm. so KW, the pilot, um, he was new to drone photography. So what I did is I exchanged teaching him composition, teaching him about ND filters and teaching him about professional filming mm. for his time to fly the drone for me in uh, a safe and protected, insured fashion. Mm -hmm. So it was like a hybrid. It was like I rented the drone and got all the gear that he needed and he operated for me while I directed all of the, the composition and whatnot mm -hmm. and taught him along the way um you know what a good drone shot looks like what your nd what your exposure should be you know all those little things wow. and so it was a give give and then again hands you know clap for ryan um he's he's a really seasoned uh, reality television dp um he shot a, a lot of okay like like reality things i, I what you know you can look him up his resumes out there he's very very talented very accomplished and um and a great friend mm -hmm. um but he knew how to get us in some nooks and crannies in la and then match that up with mario our producer who also found us tons of great safe locations safe. that really worked yeah that's the thing any anybody out there looking for advice about shooting films and whatnot safety 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 always first always first it mm -hmm. it it doesn't matter the shot you get if if you a either can't use it because someone can come after you later because you didn't pay for the rights of something like say the Hollywood sign, or b oh. God forbid someone on your crew gets hurt or whatever. Um, it's about being safe and being responsible. So we used a lot of our professional like tricks, resources like, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, just like all right, all right. If we show up here at midnight and we're out of there by one fifteen, no one will know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and we're in a back alley somewhere in East LA. You know what I mean? Right. So, so it is what it is. So some were permitted, you know, like the beach was yeah. a permitted shoot. You know, you can't just show up on a beach and shoot. Oh, I didn't know, you know that. No, not in LA. You can't shoot anywhere basically in LA. If you're going to use any kind of, um, wow, I think it comes down to the boom mic. New York, mm. it used to come down to anything that would go on the sidewalks. So you couldn't put tripods down. You couldn't put lights down. Hmm. But I believe in Los Angeles, they kind of twi changed it to um, as soon as they see a boom mic in play. Yeah, they, they here in a real thing. here in Vegas, it's a tripod. Once you get your tripod out, like you're done. They will kick you out of every single casino. Yeah. Like don't even th actually don't even pull out your camera. Don't pull out your cell phone. You are going to get in trouble. So don't even think yeah. about. Yeah, not not possible. Yeah, I actually I love filming in Vegas. There's some um, I've, I've done some stuff for shows and whatnot, playing at casinos or I've mm -hmm. done. I mean, I, I came to Vegas and directed a commercial with Robert Goulet for Camelot one time. Now that was a trip. <laughs> wow. Um, and so like, I know, I know on every production, there's always going to be something like, did you guys encounter any particular struggles or like crazy events? Like I've heard stories about boom mics melting here in Vegas because it's so hot. Like, what were some of the challenges you faced during filming a Pink Opaque? Well, one of the, the challenging stories that we've kind of been talking to people and 
I can find another one if, if it, this one's been too cashed out. But when we were filming, there was a lot of fires going on around Los Angeles. Oh, that's right. So, yeah. So during our principal photography, particularly the beach scene. So if your audience hopefully watches Pink Opaque and they yes. see the beach scene, um, this is a little behind the scenes of what it took to film that beach scene. So mm. we were up in Malibu um, at a wonderful beach and thankfully the beach has a very steep bluff, probably about 40 to 60 foot drop from where the... Which, which beach was this? I, I feel like I know exactly which one you're thinking of, and I can't think of the name El either. El Camarillo, I think. Uh, I forget the name I of the beach. I I'll, guess I'll Google it and I'll put it in the comments or something. Yeah, I can, I can, I can find it. I think it was El... El, El Matador? Rio. El Matador, yeah, Matador Beach. That would make sense. Matador Beach. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a little parking lot, and then you have to truck everything down these stairs. Oh my gosh. And then we kind of set up uh, down below the bluff. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, because as soon as we set up, within minutes, it seemed like the wind started coming offshore. So from above the bluff, mm -hmm. and it started picking up to almost about 60 mile an hour gusts. Ooh. So our video village in the parking lot looked like a sandstorm, like mm -hmm. outside the car, like where we set up everything inside the van. You couldn't even see because the sand was flying everywhere mm. now at the same time the fires had just started up in ventura and they were raging across the malibu mountains the santa monica malibu canyon mm. and mountains yeah and they were heading our way so if the audience watches the beach scene they'll see what looks to be a wonderful kind of like silky beautiful diffusion of the sunlight creating a beautiful wow. backdrop for our film, but that's fire racing towards us. Oh my gosh. From the north. So we filmed as quickly as possible, got everyone offset as fast as possible through mm -hmm. the sandstorm up top. Cause as you brought everyone from the kind of sheltered beach mm -hmm. where they were hidden from the, the, the wind and all of everything that was happening, then we had to get talent and cameras and media and lighting and everything through wow. this sandstorm where that's not good. As you can imagine being from Vegas, I can, I'm sure sand and yeah. cameras do not go great. Together. It hurts too. It doesn't feel good. Yeah. It hurts. I mean, talk about exfoliation, you <laughs> yeah. know, that's like, Bones. so, and so we had to get everybody into the cars and, and get out of the location and basically run out of Malibu mm -hmm. while the hills of Malibu were burning. And, and the breathing too, was it affecting anybody's breathing like the a asthma? No, and... no. It, luckily it was still far enough away from us and we were in the wind too. The, the wind made it so that it was, you know, the smoke was just going right out to the, the ocean. Wow. I, you know? I feel like there's always, I, I knew it. I was like, there's always something like the craziest stories when you're like, oh, I'm just going to go make a movie where I'll just have this day, this day, this day. And you're like, nope, Murphy's Law comes back to play. And you're like, wait, yeah. what? I was not expecting that. But I mean, luckily you guys were safe for the most part. And I'm, and I'm. Yeah. Oh no, we, we were safe the whole time. Like we had eyes on it. We had, you know, and obviously they would have closed the beach. The, right. You know, the, the beach patrol would have come through, kicked everybody off. You know, we were permitted for the, the, the filming like, of like five people or whatever, Max and the crew, and that's all we had down on the beach. So we we're all mm -hmm. in compliance and that's all we needed for the scene. But um, but yeah, it was kind of like, all right, let's keep an eye on this. All right, let's 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 get out of here now. Yeah. Now's a good time to go. And I, um, I'm familiar with uh, Matador Beach and it's, it's, it is, you guys, it is a cliff. Like you're there and then you go down and then there's the beach. So whoever was like lugging and carrying all that stuff, <laughs> yeah good big, job big for you guys out. uh yeah yeah sto uh like a couple of dudes on the crew were, were like sweating yeah really really sweating um including me but yeah so i was running media back up and down and whatever but i was the dit for our shoot too so um as you as you scroll the credits of pink opaque you'll see dave ragsdale on a few just a few i did items. I, I noticed that. I, I noticed that on a lot of indie films when I, because I look at the credits and I'm like, oh, he did this, this, this. Okay, yeah, he was that. Okay, yeah. So we all wear multiple hats, especially in the you indie level. Yeah, mm -hmm. as you mentioned before, it's um, 
you know, it's something too. back to what you were saying is that, you know, you hear the stories of people getting picked, plucked out of the crowd and all of a sudden their lives becoming this and that, that rarely happens. But part of my professional world has been very blessed by working with many of the, or, you know, uh, arguably the best in the business, you know, De Niro, Scorsese, you know, whoever, Ooh. like, you know, getting to meet these people, do some sort of promotional, whatever it is to sell, whatever movie they're doing. And, and so I've gotten to meet a lot of literally the most famous people in the mm -hmm. world and 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, they are the most wonderful, hardworking, dedicated, mm -hmm. incredibly talented, smart, like people. They're, they're there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's usually the, the best of the best of the best. It's not because they were lucky. It's because they were doing exactly what we're doing. They did the grind. They did the work and they continue to do the grind and they continue to do the work. And that's what's kept them, you know, like, like dudes like Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. I love Kevin Hart. Yeah, I've filmed good. actually in Vegas a few times with Kevin Hart Call for his, time. Uh, well, I think he does something called like the heart week or something where he does this thing all these events in Las Vegas mm. to promote, you know, youth health and all that kind of stuff, like good, wow. like good stuff, you mm -hmm. know? And he is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, works hard, good team around yeah. him, all of that. Like that's, you know. I anyway. think, I, I think um, your talent can only get you so far, but I think it's your work ethic that's really gonna yeah. carry you the whole way because I mean, it's hard and I like we, I guess the theme of our podcast today is, things don't don't always just fall into your lap. I think you kind of have to make them make them fall you into to, your you, lap. Yeah. You have to work for it. Yeah, there I, I don't I'm bad with sayings, but there's something about so like I. luck equals hard work meets opportunity or yeah, some something like, or whatever, but it's 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 about tenacity yeah. and never giving up. Mm -hmm. Basically. I agree. And unless you really suck, then you should give up, but you know. <laughs> you can always keep working. I mean, who knows? Anything's possible. Dude, I'm anything's just kidding. possible. I'm just kidding, I'm just like, kidding. Anything's possible. Never uh, give up, yeah, never I give mean, up. Yeah, I mean, look at all the and reality don't ever shows. let anybody tell you you suck. Don't yeah. ever, don't ever let a dude like me tell you you suck, because no, you never know. I've you had a couple of those. You might click, and it hurts. you might click with the right role. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You might click with the right, the right director, the right script, yeah. you know? I mean, Sam, Sam Jackson, right? Mm -hmm. Look at his story, right? He, what a great guy, uh, but you know, from addiction to Spike Lee, yeah, casting him, and it's then amazing. bam, you know, God bless Sam Jackson. So. Um, and so, um, what surprise was this your first? So this is your first feature film, correct? That's what you said. So this is my first narrative feature film. Yes, okay. I've been involved with uh, feature length documentary films in the mm -hmm. past, predominantly for the music industry, for bands like the Rolling Stones and the Who and that kind of stuff, like, you know, tour documentaries and Dope. things like that. Um, and other kind of like longer form documentaries, usually around some sort of social justice issue, you know. Mm. Okay, um, mm, this all makes sense. What was some of the things that surprised you that you maybe weren't aware um, when creating this film, like anything that was just like, oh shoot, I didn't expect that to happen. You know, you know, and maybe this sounds sappy, but what I didn't expect to happen was to have so many people say yes to helping. Oh um, yeah. That was, that was really, um, I think it came down to the, the, the story in mm -hmm. the script. You know, I think, you know, people were like, oh, there's no car chases. There's no gratuitous tropes of indie films that are trying to get distribution. There's just some people talking, you know? And so it was like, oh, I see someone in my family like that. Or, oh, I know a friend who lived through something like that. Or, oh, myself, I always wished mm -hmm. I w went to film school. Or, you know, I went to film school and now I, I felt that struggle. Like whatever it was, it was, I was just really surprised at how many people like said yes and helped. And again, going back to that, I have that, you know, word of advice for anybody is, you know, never ask for anything more than someone is willing to contribute right. because all that does is build on resentment and it just builds on expectations. You know, you hope that they would come through for you and then they didn't. And then that's a whole game you don't even want to play. Mm -hmm. And so if you just avoid that from the, from the go and only really do the ask for what people really want to contribute, 
then you have that ability to really build a team that you can rely on, Mm -hmm. you know? And then the second part of it, and I want to say this properly, I've talked to Hassani a little bit about this here and there, but it's about keeping people around. Mm -hmm. Like this is a long, long road. Right. You know, and I've been, frankly, I've been working my arse off for (laughs) years. And now I'm pretty much not the only one. There's still definitely people around and definitely people that are like, hey, congrats, that's great, that's great. But Mm -hmm. it comes down to someone has to do the work. Right. And there's no budget to pay people and whatnot. So it's me. Like it's me doing all the work still. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like you got to hope that you – That's yeah, it's one of the bigger surprises that – people just kind of like not walk away, but they it's could. also, it's part of, well, they could it's, and it's not that it's like, people have to live their lives. They have to move on. And that's also part of our dynamics of the team that we brought together. Right. A lot of professionals, they're all moving on to their gigs. They all have professional things they need to do. Their attention gets pulled. They're on new projects. You know, that's, that comes with the territory of having very talented people involved. Yeah. And I'm thankful for all of them and thankful for every bit of work that they've done to help us get at this far. But ultimately, it's on my desk still. And so right. it's, it, it, that's one of the bigger surprises that you kind of have this, oh, I'm going to make a film. I'm going to you know, work with great actors. I'm going to tell a great story. And then all of a sudden, it's kind of like the stepchild sitting in your kitchen looking at you going, what's next, dad? You know, and you're mm-hmm. like, all right, well, I've got to, I've got to, this is like my kid. I have to keep helping it along its way Mm -hmm. and so that's one of the bigger surprises yeah you know I it's like when you said that my my wheels started turning I was like gosh you know I really need to listen to that myself because I always have such a hard time asking for help just because I'm like yeah no one's gonna want to help you know people have their things to do but yeah I I should probably ask for some help that's a good thing because people do they want to help and and one of the things I say all the time is a lot of times people just want to be a part of something um whether it's paid or not, you just want to be included and creative and collaborative. And that's what draws a lot of people to come and help. Absolutely. Pe- people want to, you know, use their creative muscles, if you will. Yeah. You know? and, and, if you, and if you can get them to do their best work to help your project, that's wonderful. Yeah. And it, it's hard to do things on your own, like to get it started. But if there's like a team going, like you're going to be more inclined to like contribute and create more and it's just hard sometimes to like do things on your own. So yes, think about that to yes. myself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's, and for your honest, it's very hard to do anything your own, particularly in this medium. Mm-hmm. You know, I, uh, I often say on, you know, my commercial shoots or branded shoots or whatever, um, you know, it takes an ecosystem and that's even more relevant in a narrative feature world that it takes an ecosystem of people working very hard in this pushing in the same direction Mm -hmm. and that all have um good intentions for the project you can't do anything alone you can't don't even try get your network going yeah right and so with that ecosystem um who did the post-production did you guys have an editor did you do that how did that um derek and i derek and i did the majority of the post we uh did the first kind of assembly cut you know we both Mm -hmm. attack different different uh chunks of the film and then we brought in um an editor really talented another wonderful woman if we want to give him a shout out okay wait 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 wait. ladies uh, representing yep yeah 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 we try to represent we wanted a very you guys did a great job um you can't tell a story like this from one point of view you Mm -hmm. have to have a lot of filters on it. So one of those filters was Autumn Dia and she was great. So she came on after we kind of assembled our very kind of like cutty cut performance take, best, best take, best take, best take, best take, which basically was, you know, take the best take that we love from each line, Mm -hmm. slam them together, together. watch it down. And it's just like people talking, you know? Mm -hmm. So she put pacing into it. She put you know, breath. She massaged she put, it. Yeah. She kind of just took all, yeah, took all that hyper editing that, that Derek and I did. Cause we knew like 
you know, we just basically wanted to give her everything that we really loved from a performance point of view and then asked her to kind of just stretch it out a little bit and mm -hmm. give it some pacing and tone and tempo. And then from there, um, it went back to Derek and I, mm -hmm. um, we recut several scenes. Sorry, Autumn. Um, they were great. Just need something and, different. And or we, we felt, we felt they were better, not in a bad way, but a good way. Just for a different um, story. Yeah. 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 Just in different things. And then basically I did a huge part of the online edit. So all the, the mastering and Oh. Well, well, we had, you know, great colorist, Tristan came aboard, our colorist, Tristan, fantastic colorist, really did a great mm -hmm. job. Um, but that was basically him and I, and then I did, yeah, I did all the, like, what they call online editing, which is the, the final uh, mastering and final assembly okay. and all, all the final audio and working with the, the labs and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So very hands-on from from uh, from all of us. And so with your ecosystem of creating a team, now that the film is complete, what was the process of post-production? Like how long did that take? Did you have a deadline going into the festivals or was it get it done then festivals? What was that process like for you? Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we definitely had a lot of deadlines and a lot of milestones that we were trying to keep on track, but obviously, you know, with indie films and, and people's availability and people's time and, you know, it, you know, good, fast, cheap, right? Pick two, you, can, mm. you know, in production, you can have it good, you can have it fast, you can have it cheap. You can never have all three. So we wanted it good and mm. we wanted it, we had to be cheap. So it took a little longer than, than we really would have liked and anticipated, which caused a few uh, festivals that I was, I was hoping to end up premiering at and whatnot, mm -hmm. but all said and done, we were able to get through post-production and, and get to a, a cut in time for AFM um, in 2019. American film which market. Which was great. Yeah. So everybody yeah. out there, American film market is a, obviously a very important uh, kind of milestone on your calendar. If you're going to be producing a film, um, you should have hopefully your, if not a solid rough cut, a, a, a full assembled film you could say is ready for the lab you mm -hmm. know ready to go into final processing ready for final color final sound final final tweaks final lab work um so we were able to accomplish that goal which was fantastic and then that started uh getting a little bit of distribution offers mm -hmm. from afm we worked with a uh, talented uh, producer, a social, like a uh, consulting producer that helped connect us with uh, different distributors for meetings at AFM. Mm -hmm. Another note to your audience, don't ever go to AFM without setting up your meetings beforehand. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Always, 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 always set up everything before you show up at AFM. Don't think you're going to walk into a meeting a room and knock on a door and anyone will actually speak to you. And here's a quick little story about that. So there we are with our fresh little indie film all in the can, ready to go. And our meetings all set up from our coordinating producer who's done a really great job to get us some really great meetings. Mm -hmm. And we show up at uh, one of our meetings and um, there's kind of a handler at, at the front door, kind of, you know, like a bouncer, if you will, you mm -hmm. know, making sure no one goes in. And, and it, it started from a, who are you guys, basically, well, you know, in a, in a right. professional tone, but like, who are you? to uh, signing us and becoming our sales agent and our, and our, uh, been our shepherd. Uh, yeah. Jeffrey Giles from automatic entertainment, big shout out to Jeffrey. Yay. He's been, he's been my uh, kind of shepherd and my, my, my rep on pink opaque, but mm -hmm. you know, that that's how it goes. Like you got to be prepared at AFM. You gotta, you gotta be able to speak quickly, speak efficiently and get your foot in the door say what you have to say when you're in the room. Have your elevator pitch ready to go. Have it ready to go, have it ready to go. So basically at, at Jeffrey's advice, he's like, let's start looking at festivals. And then mm. we were lucky that we were um, the opening night film for the San Diego Black Film Festival um, shortly after New Year 2020. So I believe it was something like January, maybe maybe towards the end of January mm. 2020, January, January 20 something we premiered down uh, in San Diego, our San Diego premiere, which was great. We won best picture, best drama, best actor, best director, best everything, it. I guess. 
Congratulations. Yeah, we, 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 like we, yeah, thank you. It was like, whoa, first, first festival we've, you know. Hey, that's a great way to that's start pretty, the circuit. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, and it was live. Like it was, you know, they, they actually sold out um, two theaters that, you know, so the first theater sold out and they had to push the audience over to a second theater that sold out. Um, and uh, man, I wish we had our final color grade for that for that mm. print, but we didn't, we did. Mm-hmm. It was just a, a working print. Um, but anyway, it went off and went off swimmingly as they say. And, uh, and then from there we were, uh, accepted into, um, the, uh, Pan-African film festival here in Los Angeles, okay. which is a, a rather, uh, prestigious, um, film festival. For, oh, um, you said Pan-African or Pan, isn't there, isn't it an Asian There's one? Pan-Asian as well, but there's, this is the Pan-African. Okay. I see. I see. Yeah, two different. I, I I think it's two completely different organizations. I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay. Um, but Pan African is um, it's probably it's the biggest uh, Los Angeles based black film festival. Wow. And it's on the if you look at the kind of you Google top ten black film festivals, um, it's it's always in there like three, four, six. You know, because like it's ABFF and then sometimes Pan African or ABFF and then. I don't know somewhere else, and then Pan African, but they're they're a big, they're in. We were also to, able to screen live to an audience, which was wonderful, wow. and that was February 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the you Pandemic. know at that point we thought we were going to go into distribution. We were talking with a a streamer um, that we were kind of excited to, you know, kind of an up and coming streamer, not not Netflix, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, not not Amazon, but another streamer that we mm-hmm. thought would would go well uh, and be a good platform for us to reach an audience. Um, and then you know, pandemic, you know, so right. that was fun. You know, here you are, finished film, ready to go to distribution, already getting some nice festival nods, and and uh, everything's prime. The cast is prime. There's their the crew is smiling. The, everything, and then it's just you know, the good old record scratch, you know, or the car screeching <laughs> to a halt or yeah. whatever sound effect you want to put in there. And uh, the world changed yeah. for all of us, you know, and you had then that, we just, we went that carrot that you were like just about to get and you're like, nope, sorry. Yeah. And, and you know, had we had the proper funding to be able to, you know, get through some of the, the time issues with post-production and things like that, we may not have missed, we may have not have hit some of these speed bumps along the way, you know, if we were mm-hmm. able to get it done a little earlier, a few months earlier than, than we were, but you know, happenstance is happenstance is what it is, is what it is. So you just move forward the best you can. And, and so what we did is we just dived head first into festivals. Okay. We were just like, yeah. Cause, um, and I'm sure Hassani has heard all the stories and he knows, and I'm sure you've heard it too. You know, when the theaters close, the, the a list, you know, the A titles, you know, the big shows are now going to move on to streamers, which mm. then made the the smaller theatrical distributed films then down to streamers. And then even the art house distributed theatrically films down into the streamers. And so it just created this incredible log jam or whatever you want to call it. Just mm. the every title you can imagine was now in front of Pink Opaque. Wow. It was more, you know, they had bigger casts, they had bigger budgets, they were already connected with distributors, they, they were already approved, you know, ready for theatrical distribution. So they had their PNA in place, they had, you know, all of those things that we didn't have yet, we didn't have, we didn't have a home yet. Mm. You know, we had lost our home, because, the you know, granted, down the streamer couldn't afford to yeah. buy our rights, because there was no money to buy the rights. So whatever, you know, oh my God. so there we are just like kind of in limbo in a way. And that's why we went really, we're just like, all right, let's go festival, festival, festival. And then we were very fortunate, you know, ABFF, you know, a lot, a lot of really great, great festivals have picked us up mm-hmm. and uh, we're playing Paris the, the, this next week in uh, the Nollywood Paris Film Festival. That's so cool. Um, we've played Seoul, South Korea. We've played Istanbul, Turkey. We've played um uh, several cities in the uk we've played dublin we've played uh brazil uh in rio like literally worldwide 
Yeah, we're starting to, we're trying, that's where we're trying to get, you know, a little, little audience here and a little audience there mm -hmm. because, because the, the nature of our story isn't super commercial. It's not super, you know, there's, there's not a lot of, you know, gun, sex and drugs, you know, right. it's, 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 it's a nice little story and a nice film. And I think when people finally see it, they go, Oh, that was pretty good. Oh, that was, that was a pretty good story. You know, pretty good, pretty well done, you know? Um, but, uh, so that was the strategy and, and now, and now thankfully, uh, we found our home at 1091 and yes. I'm feeling really, really great about that. And, uh, what a wonderful group of people so far that I've seen and talked to and, and, uh, yeah for good things moving forward and you guys just had an article <clears throat> sorry i'm dying not an article but a a spot a feature in usa today right correct yeah is that what i saw yeah uh yeah us and our you know our our, our cousin film takeout girl were both listed in the usa today's that's huge just summer movies of 2021 to check out um which as like a little both being you know lower budget fair um, it's pretty incredible. We, we were listed right after Space Jam. So I mean, if you can't imagine like LeBron James and then like my cast. You're like, it's like, hey. wow. like, yeah, it's like, wow. It's, 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 uh, it, that, that kind of blew my mind. I had no idea. I had no idea it was coming down. And, and then when, when 1091 reached out and said, Hey, by the way, did you see this? And I'm like, Oh, thank yeah. you. No, I didn't. Thank you. <laughs> That's really fantastic. Yeah. I can't believe it. And you know, mm -hmm. Generally, like I said, generally when people finally get to see the film, they have a pretty positive reaction from it. Mm -hmm. And so that's our challenge really is building awareness, building um, just the, the brand of Pink Opaque so that people know even hear of it or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so speaking of how, like where, when, how can we watch it? Is it going to be, a, I know it's available soon if you want to drop those details because we've been talking about it and now we're getting people curious and I've already seen yeah, it because well, I'm cool, but everybody yeah, else. Well, yeah, you're, you're one of the cool kids. <laughs> um, you have one of those screeners. I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, okay. I'm, I don't. I don't have official, official release dates. I believe that it's July 27th. Mm -hmm. Our first kind of marketing meetings and whatnot will be taking place when this premieres. So I will be, when this premieres, I will be probably in my first marketing meeting. I think it's the same day that this oh. premieres. Um, and, but it will be, you know, video on demand. So it'll be across platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll be, you know, the iTunes, the Amazons, the, I guess the Roku's, the PlayStation's, the, well, not Roku, but PlayStation, um, Microsoft, you know, mm -hmm. Xbox, uh, wherever you can get. And I think that 1091 is also trying to maybe find if there's some sort of uh, broadcast partner or um, premium kind of uh, digital distribution they could do, like sell us to a Amazon Prime or a, mm -hmm. or a Netflix or, um, one of the, you know, one of the many yeah. services that are starting to ramp back up, which is basically where we were going to go anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, if that could happen, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so hopefully July 27th on basically any screen that you can purchase a film and, okay. uh, I hope your audience enjoys it. I, I, really hard. I think so. I think so. I'll be crossing my fingers. And then, of course, when everything is released and we have all the inf official information, I will drop some links and comments and all that stuff in uh, below. And, of course, I'm going to be posting like crazy on my Instagram page, Always Acting Up Podcast. So, so we'll get all the thank information. You, thank you. And do you have any like last advice for future filmmakers before we get before we get into our moment of positivity? Filmmakers who are maybe about to embark on their first feature film things you wish you would have known when you first started. Well, luck, lucky for me and the team, we've, we've all, we all came from relative uh, experience levels that, that we could handle a lot of problems. We, you know, we were lucky that we had you know, a lot of pros on, on set. So for people starting out, if maybe this is their first film, if they're new to the filmmaking process, if they're learning like, camera technology, lighting, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. And I don't mean to be rude, but like, keep it simple, stupid. Like that old, the old kiss, <laughs> right? 
seriously, keep it simple. <laughs> keep it on the story. Mm -hmm. Keep it on what is necessary for your character to get what they need in that scene and what obstacle is in front of them, mm -hmm. get through that obstacle and move forward to the next scene. Don't get hung up on elaborate one-y shots, elaborate 360 shots, yeah. elaborate tracking shots, elaborate car chases. Keep it simple because the simpler you keep it, the more manageable it is. And the more manageable it is, the more you're able to tell a real story. Mm -hmm. um, that would be my biggest advice. Everybody wants to do a huge Scorsese one -y, but that takes about a week to pre-light with a team of 40 people. Yeah. And two, and two or three or four lighting trucks. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that as independent filmmakers. We, we need to work within our means and really focus your energy on what you can accomplish. That's the other bit. This is the part two is focus your energy and your attention on what can be accomplished, not what can't be accomplished. There's not Ooh. worth the discussion of what can't be done. When something can't be done, you move on and you work on what can be done. It's a waste of time, energy, and effort to argue or pitch or mm -hmm. fight for something that can't be done. Do right. what you can with what you have. That's it. And That's your, my biggest advice. Then your next film. Then you can go all out once you build up a little bit. Even get then, your budget. I say your next film. Yeah, well, if you, even then, when you get a little bit more budget, yeah. right? Even when you get a little more budget, keep it even more simple because there's going to be more people trying to bite on that budget and take it away from you and all that True. stuff. And you're going to need the money to tell the story because all of a sudden your story is now elevated. Hmm. You're now, you now have a, a higher expectation on your deliverable, right? To whoever your partners are. True. So within that, you have to always maintain the expectations of what you are delivering. Mm -hmm. So that my advice is, yeah, you get a couple bucks, hold on to them. And would you when, say, you know, not, not to be cheap, but when you call and you say to somebody, I really love your house as a location. It's amazing. It would really be great in my film. I'd love to film there. And they say, okay, what's your budget? You always say, <laughs> well, I'm sorry, w w as close to free as you can. Right. And then you get the number from them. And then you even try to talk down that number even a little bit more. And then hopefully you have a couple bucks left. Uh, for other things. Oh, and the I other like advice, the, the other main, main core advice for anybody trying to get a film going, and this is probably the best advice I could give to anybody trying to get a film on set, on its feet, working. Pay attention. Actors, cameras, everything. Feed your crew well. Ooh, Period. Food. Period. End of story. <laughs> Feed your crew and your cast well, I'm not saying lobster tails. I'm not saying it's, you know, the palm every night. Mm -hmm. But if you can put care and concern into what they're feeding, what they're able to eat for their hot meals, what's there for crafty, what's there mm -hmm. all day, you know, in the coolers, you know, you feed your crew really, really well. And you're going to get a much better product. You could pay them more. Mm-hmm but they won't care as much as if you feed them well and they see that you care about them. Right. I mean, that's and that's probably the biggest advice. Yeah. Let's, let's be real. The most important thing on a film set is where crafty. True. Yeah. And if, True. and if you have crap crafty, like, you know, Costco has a too. lot of great products. Yeah. yeah. What's it? People yeah. get, people get grumpy when you're hungry. I mean, I get, I mean, my energy is going to get down and, I'm getting grumpy because I'm hungry and I just, I'm hungry. Just feed me. Yeah, you're, I get it. You're already scheduling, you know, as, as, as indie as Pink Opaque was, we still tried to schedule like legit days, 10 hour days. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we rolled to 12, you know, we had one or two like 12 hour on the day schedules, but we tried our best to have it as, as on point as if we were showing up for one of our commercial, you know, studio gigs or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we took that same approach with uh with food you yeah. know um and it, it, it i think it paid dividends for the crew's attitude throughout yeah the whole time yeah oh speaking of questions left over um i actually didn't tell you guys um can they can anyone reach out to you if they wanted to ask you any additional questions or um stay in contact with you how can they get hold of you i forgot well i guess instagram's probably the best 
way to get in touch or whatever, you know, at mm-hmm. Dave Rags, Dave underscore Ragsdale. Um, D-A-V-E. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. Um, one, one thing that I don't, that I don't need is uh, headshots or resumes. <laughs> don't need those. Definitely don't need those. Um, I cast very specific for any role or any project I'm working on. And a lot of my casting, to be honest, comes already uh, included in the project that I'm producing or directing. Mm. You know, if I'm working for a particular brand or a particular uh, studio, um, a lot of a lot of that casting is already, already done. baked in. So there's not a lot of opportunity uh, for actors with me in that regard. But yes, absolutely. My Instagram at Dave Ragsdale, at Dave underscore Ragsdale, and obviously um, at Pink Opaque Film um, mm. on Instagram. And, uh, I'm not really on Facebook or any of those things. Um, send those DMs that's guys. The best way. Okay, cool. Yeah. That would be great. Um, and I am going to transition us to an in to the moment of positivity. Yeah. I'm on to breathe here. So at the end of every podcast, I like to have a moment of positivity where you can share um, a personal favorite quote or something that really keeps you going during those hard times. Um, I would be honored if you had a moment for us. I don't know how positive it is, but it's something that truly I, I live by mm-hmm. and I, um, I bring every day onto set with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an old Stanislavski quote, you know, from mm-hmm. my days growing up being an actor. And that's, you know, Love the theater within yourself, not yourself in the theater. Oh. And I think that everybody needs to really, really think on that and work on that if they want to be a creative professional, if they want to be in this industry long, long term. You know, I'm, I'm in my 25th year of being a professional director, working on a very high level um, with incredible. very, very, very talented people. And I'm very lucky for that. And that's because every single day I love the theater within myself, not myself in the theater and that's your attitude that's what you bring to every project every interaction every every take every call of action every call of cut all of it it's all about loving that theater in you not you in this world Mm. of material and fame and whatever because that in the end of the day is all bullshit Oh, that's great. I love that. I actually have never heard that one before, but it's, it's, that's great. It's literally, and I say it all the time on set, like, especially if, you know, someone's getting really having a hard day. It's like, you know, love that, you know, the story in you, you know, not, Mm -hmm. it's not about being in this world where you get a, you know, a pat on your back and you're, Oh, look how good you are. You know, Mm -hmm. no, it's the greats. Don't do that. That's not Mm -hmm. how the greats operate. Wow. So I've seen it firsthand. They don't. They don't come anywhere close to. Please tell me I'm good. That's you so know what cool. I mean. That doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist at the at, at the A level. Yeah. Like wow. the ballers, the real players. That doesn't exist. To their mind, they're terrible. They sucked. They oh, have to do it better. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's so, all of us. Love the theater within yourself, not yourself in the theater. Boom. Hopefully um, that was positive enough. No, I I, I loved it. Um, that was great. Um, and I do want to mention uh, for you guys who are watching on the video, Dave has some awards behind him in the background of his video. Are those from some of the film festivals? Yeah. Yeah. And I have some more at the office, like the Vegas trophy is at the office. One of those, the, the flower bud there, mm-hmm. that's from um, a festival in uh, the UK. The, um, which one is it? It's pretty. I like it. International them. Film Festival of Wales. Okay. Um, and then the the trophy there is from um, Urban Film Festival, a really kind of cool um, organization. I, part, part of what we did when we targeted uh, festivals we wanted to be part of was finding um, festivals that had good org- uh, educational um, arms and educational kind of programs and, okay. and things. And so Urban Film Festival has a lot of really great, they're out of Miami, and they mm-hmm. do a lot of great um, classes for kids and all that kind of stuff. But wow. yeah, those are two of, I forget how many we've won, but I know we've, we've won about 40 awards Whoa. or something. That is amazing. 
50 festivals maybe i thought you were countries now i thought you were gonna say you were seeking out film festivals that had cool trophies <laughs> no i mean no, hey i don't know no and then to be honest i could have gotten a bunch more but they want you to buy them i, I know yeah. i'm just not into buying trophies yeah, it's, it's a lot. Well, fabulous. Thank you so much for joining um, us on the podcast today. I think there's a lot of information for you guys to learn. Um, is there any last words that you wanted to, uh, or any shout outs you wanted to say before we head out here for this week? No, just sorry if I forgot anybody that was key on the team today, but because everybody worked really, really hard and, and yeah. everybody, uh, you know, it, this is, like I said, it's an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's not Dave. It's not Derek. It's not just Ryan. It's not just Mario. It's everybody. The team. And, uh, yeah, that, that's the biggest thing for your audience is um, be nice. Attract people by being nice. Mm -hmm. Don't the, the old the old way of being like, I'm a hot shot is that's done. Doesn't work. Like, be nice. Do nice things for people. Don't expect things from people and and show up and do your job and the rest will happen. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining. Um, you guys make sure to check out Pink Opaque Film. Uh, film or films? Film. Yeah. So film. Pink Opaque Film. On Instagram. Yep. And On Instagram. Dave underscore Ragsdale. On Instagram as well. Send him a DM for any questions. And absolutely check out the trailer and the film when it drops. And I will be including that information in the comments below. Um, on my YouTube channel, as well as pretty much everywhere else I'm posting on my Instagram, which is now always acting up podcast, or you can follow me on my Ooh. other, my other Instagram, which is Castlin Rose. How else can people reach me? I don't know. Um, like comment, make sure to subscribe and press that little bell so that you have notifications next time a video comes out. And you guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are almost done with the end of our season here. But until then, have a good day. Hey, that's basically it. And thanks for your time. Thank Hope you I so wasn't much. too wordy. Please cut, 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 whatever you need. Yeah, I'll I flap. I, I'll cut. Um, I, I like I loved everything you said. Um, I'm just going to cut uh, some of our little chit chat in there and otherwise that was fantastic thank you for sharing the time with us because i know you guys you guys are yeah, so no busy so i appreciate well, the you know. appreciate the time yeah or you can even be and that code for 25% off.